Thanks for downloading our podcast today. We hope it helps and encourages you. You are very welcome to join us any Sunday at 11am and 6pm at our church home at 11 Bruce Street, Belfast. Check out our website at www.lifechurchbelfast.com for more details. Give it up for Steve Matthew. Thank you, Owen. Well, this is very cosy, isn't it? It's a little more intimate on a Sunday night. It's the first time I've had this experience. This is good. This is good. I don't know about the mighty rushing wind in the background, but there we go. <clears throat> Holy Spirit's gone. <laughs> yes, I'll use that. I wasn't sure how much light I'd have, so I've got my light version, you see, as well as my plastic version. I want to chat to you more than kind of preach tonight. Um, I don't know how tuned in you are to what God is doing, but it seems to me something shifted about three weeks ago. And I don't just mean here, I mean in Bradford and in Leeds and here. And I know these guys are on page. <clears throat> and Owen came back and he preached Turn It Up Jesus' message. And a number of people I've picked up on Twitter, I've picked up on chatting to people, that they, there was a, a sense that something just shifted, even if it was something's changed in him. Yeah. <laughs> it's like Owen shared his heart and what went on? What was that? Well, I want to just kind of elevate the moment, pull it out for you and say, for those that have ears to hear... Something shifted, yeah. and it didn't just shift here. Something shifted in Bradford and in Leeds and here, because as a senior leadership team, we felt God just get a hold of us and take us up a notch and say, come on, guys, wake up, smell the coffee. Um, this is all about us being on point, on mission. Yeah. It's about us being prepared to actually count the cost for what God has saved us for. It's not about playing church. It's not about nice whizzy buildings and fancy lights and smoke. It's actually about people. Yeah. It's about changed lives. Yeah. But it's about having the tools to reach them, which is what this is all is. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> I just felt as I was thinking about what to share with you tonight to elevate that, the season we're in. Because I think we're in a season of change. Yeah. And um, I know we live in perpetual change just because we're human beings. <laughs> and things are always changing. But I think in the journey of life, church, God has just infused us at the start of this year. We did the devotional. We did the 30-day thing. Yeah. We were all on point together. All the three congregations, heart and soul, in this building and growing together. Um, <clears throat> Charlotte and Steve spoke strongly to the leadership team and to the staff a few weeks ago when Owen was over. I think we all felt that God was just speaking to us as leaders to get a hold of our people, those God's entrusted to us, and say, come on, this is about us doing the mission God has called us for. Stuff we already know, but we need to maybe approach it a little differently. And is it in my own sort of praying and thinking about this season, God took me to David in the Old Testament. And um, you all know David, well, you maybe all don't know David's story, but you all know kind of David and Goliath and the famous bits of his story. And the scripture that I want to just share with you is Psalm 78, verse 70, right at the end of a long psalm, which is a little bit of a um, telling the story of the journeying of God's people up to David's life. And it says this about David. It says that God chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheep pens, from tending the sheep, and brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart, and with skillful hands, he led them. In a nutshell, that scripture says, God looked at David as a young lad, when he was just in the sheep pens. Look after his dad's sheep on the mountainside, doing his thing in the family, normal life, routine, and he saw something. And he took him from the sheep pen and made him the shepherd of Israel, made him the king. Yeah. 
In other words, there was something in his ordinary life that was preparing him for ruling, for destiny, for purpose, and so on. It says that David ruled well because he says he had integrity of heart. So there was an inside job that God saw. You know from other scriptures that God, David's described as being a man after God's heart. His, His heart was good. So he shepherded them with integrity of heart and with skillful hands he led them. So David was prepared for kingship in heart and he was prepared in his hands. Now we could go off on one here and I could explain to you how God trained him in his hands and how God prepared him in his heart. And you, need to, you can read the story of his life for yourselves. But God worked on David's heart. He loved his heart. He had a heart for God, a heart for worship, a heart for the things of God. He became the great worship leader, the songwriter, the psalmist of Israel. He had a heart for God, didn't he? But also he had skillful hands. When he was in that sheep pen, he didn't just get good on his guitar and start to worship. When he was in that sheep pen, he fought off the lion, he fought off the bear. He became extremely good with a slingshot. So good with a slingshot, he could... You know, he could take Goliath out with one, which he he ends up doing. Um, Skillful hands. He became a warrior in the sheep pen, as well as a worshiper in the sheep pen. And I want to suggest to you that God has a way of just working with us in our sheep pen, in our daily routine, in our family, our business, our work, the stuff we do, whatever you think might be your sheep pen right now. And God looks at it. And he sees where you're going to be. And my prayer is that God would look at what we're doing here in Life Church and see that we are candidates for transitioning to something that's awesome. Yeah. Something that does what Trevor said in the worship. That a normal night in Belfast will not be people falling over in gutters and people injecting stuff into the veins, but a normal yeah. night will be people loving God. Yeah loving Jesus, having healthy, robust family lives, being good citizens, making a difference in the, in, in the world, that godly normality would infect our city, which means it's got to start somewhere, and it's got to start in our sheep pens. Yeah. Now, it's here, but it's got to start in us just doing life normally in a way which allows God to transition us to where he wants to be. And I got thinking about how David got from the sheep pen to be the shepherd of Israel, how, how God sort of moved him down that timeline and down that process. And a couple of things I spotted. Do you remember when David was first, he first entered the palace? It was because Saul, who was king at the time, was grumpy. And he'd done some bad things and God had sort of lifted his spirit off him and he had a bad spirit. An evil spirit from the Lord, it says. And his, his advisors think, we need to find a good, we need some soothing music. He needs some whale music. You know, he, <laughs> he needs a massage. He needs to go to the spa. He needs something to, to, to calm him down. And so, of course, the, the, the issue is, where are the most skilled musicians in the kingdom? We need the best of the best for the king. And 1 Samuel 16, verse 18 says that one of the servants answered in this debate, I've seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem, who knows how to play the lyre. He's a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well. He's a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. I mean, what a pedigree. Now, this is just a servant in the conversation. You know, that teaches me that God can get your name anywhere he wants. We're so, we're so bothered about get, getting promoted sometimes. Well, I must get myself in front of the pastor. I must get my name on the, on the rotor. Now, God can get your name wherever he wants to get your name. If you will just stay in your sheep pen, do what God has given you in your hands to do today, do it with integrity of heart and develop some skillful hands. And at the right time, God will get your name to where he needs to get it. And through the voice of a servant, Suddenly, David's transitioned into playing in the palace. It's quite different to looking after his dad's sheep. But that's how he got there initially. Transition season for him. Then as you read on the story, obviously that that season sort of comes and goes. He ends up back in the sheep, then back with his father. 
My next time he ends up making a step toward his destiny, towards the royal palace, is when he's taking sandwiches to his brothers on the front line when they're in the conflict with Goliath. You've got the Philistines lined up, you've got the Israelites lined up, and Goliath's there saying, you know, send out your best man and I'll take him on and may the best man win. And if I win, you'll be our servants. And if you win, we'll be your servants. And all those things going on. And David arrives with the sandwiches. You can sort of see it. And we have this vision of him almost like he's in short pants and a little kid. But actually, by this time, he has been anointed in private to be king. He knows destiny is in him. He's serving his dad. He's been serving at home. He's now serving his brothers. He's got a good heart. He's learned some skills in that sheep pen. He's become a warrior. And he arrives. But he's not yet, he's obviously not in the army yet. He's not old enough to be qualifying for that. And he hears Goliath spouting off. And he gets angry. He feels what God feels. He hears it and he says, what is this uncircumcised Philistine going on about? Let me at him. There's something in him that wants to, yeah. to deal with it. It's like, this is wrong. We're the people of God. What? And he's looking at his brothers and he's looking at Saul and his heart. Oh boy. Integrity of heart. God's heart. The man after God's heart. How was feeling it. But he didn't just have integrity of heart. He had skill in his hands. So he approaches Saul, as you know, many of you. And he says, hey, let me have a crack at Goliath. And of course, Saul says to him, no, you know, you're not able to go out against him. You're only a young man. But this chap's been a warrior from his youth. This is 1 Samuel 17. This is what David says to Saul. What do you mean? Your, ser <laughs> your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. So his response was, he might have been a warrior from his youth, but I've been looking after my dad's sheep. And that is my qualification. Because when I was in the sheep pen, I took out the lion, I took out the bear, and he goes on to tell the story. He knows that he's learned skills there. He's become the warrior king in the sheep pen. He's ready because of what went on in that private, hidden place. Oftentimes up on the mountainsides where nobody saw him, only God saw him. That was where the preparation took place. And he carries on the conversation. He explains to Saul that he killed a lion, he killed a bear. And the God who rescued me will rescue the armies of God. But this guy's defying the armies of the living God. And eventually Saul says to him, okay, go and the Lord be with you. But just to help you, it's we read this. It's Saul says, <clears throat> it says that Saul dressed David in his own tunic and put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head and David fastened on the sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he wasn't used to them conclusion I cannot go in these he says to Saul I'm not used to them so he took them off again he took his staff in his hand what he was used to he chose five smooth stones from the stream picked his own stones stuck them in his pouch and approached the Philistine. Actually, it says, as you read on, he ran towards the Philistine. You know the story. One shot kills Goliath. His world changed. Now he's the hero. Now he is in the palace for good. He becomes the commander of the army. A whole new life began for him. Wow, what a season of change. Because he was prepared in hands and heart in the secret place, in the yeah. sheep pen. I think as a church, we're in a season of change. But not everybody will see it. But those that see it and grasp it and run with it are those who are doing this stuff in the sheep pen. Those who are just quietly growing in their faith, chatting, their, their, you know, telling people about Jesus, living a good life for him. They're in the word. They're walking in the Holy Spirit. They're living your, a good, strong, robust, normal Christian life. And their ears are open to the voice of the Spirit. And they're, they're doing what God's put in their hand to do. They're just getting the skills honed in the sheep pen. And I believe we have to be people like that in this season. <clears throat> so I've come up with five things I want to quickly leave with you. Which I think are five things we need to be in, 
in hands and heart as we enter what I think is a new season. I don't want to define it. I just think God's turned the temperature up. Yeah. God's, to use the language of Owen here, God said, turn Jesus up. Just turn him up. Come on. Well, where is Jesus? Was well, it the right hand of the Father, brother? Yeah, that's true, but he's also here right. in us by his Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Christ dwells in us. The love of Christ has been poured in our hearts. We are the body of Christ. That's where Jesus is. And to turn Jesus up is therefore to turn up our willingness to be Jesus. And that is a time of transition, isn't it? That's a time of change. Now, I know we're supposed to be always like that, but God has a way of at certain times just saying, come on, my people, turn the gas up, come on. Awareness, remember, 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 that's what we're here for, turn me up. And I think to navigate that season, we have to be prepared in hands, the skills, we have to be prepared in heart, great attitude. And here's five things I think we have to be. First thing is this, be yourself. Be yourself. In every season of change, it doesn't mean you're changing into another person. You're still you. Be yourself. You know, for David to thrive in his next season, he just had to be himself. He had to put his hands to work. His heart had to be expressed. But the problem was Saul tried to put him in his armor. But to get the job done, he just got to be himself. He had to say, Saul, I can't wear that stuff. I can't wear your hat and your great big sword and your tunic. No, I just need to be myself. I'm a shepherd boy. I can run fast. Give me, just give me some good stones. And let me put them in my pouch. And let me get all my, all my props. You know, I'm all lined up. I'm ready. You know, he's, whoom, off he went. You can imagine him running towards him. Just like he'd done with, I don't know, I suppose I don't have Coke cans back then, did they? But I, I could imagine him having practiced with his sling. You know, lining the bottles up on the wall and getting further and further back and, yeah, I got it from 50 yards. Right, I'm going to get it from 100 yards next time. I, bet, I think he did that. Yeah. And he got better and better and better. And so he could split a hair with a stone from his slingshot. It became so good. Skill in his hand. And he just got to be himself. Be comfortable. You know, just because something has worked for someone a certain way doesn't mean it's going to work for you in a certain way. You have to do it in through your unique personality, through who you are. You know, you've said, oh, it's changing. Do I have to be a different kind of mom to my kids? No. You should keep being who you are, but just turn Jesus up in the midst of it. Let's just keep Jesus front and center. Let's remember that his kids is entrusted to us. Oh, I've got to be different at work now. No, you've just got to be yourself at work. You're a great accountant. You know those numbers. You know where all the columns are and how to add them up and stuff. But just turn Jesus up in it. Let's give him the glory for it. Let's, let's, while we're there in that world of accountancy, thank God that he's giving you provision to be able to bless others with. There's people there to reach and to help. It's just, it's life. Be yourself in the midst of the change by keeping your skills honed and your heart right. Now, it's, all really, <clears throat> it's really all about just being at peace with yourself. And um, we haven't got time to develop it here, but at other times we've talked about our spiritual shape, how essentially there are, there are things about each of us that we have to be at peace with. I have to be at peace with what my abilities are. There's some yeah. stuff I'm good at and some stuff I'm rubbish at. Yeah. yeah, I can sing. Yeah, I'm methodical. I can organize. Ah, oh, but I can't do some other stuff. <laughs> I can't dance to save my life. You know, my wife scorns me every time I try and dance. She says I don't work from the waist down. <clears throat> uh, when it comes to dancing <laughs> and all that. Uh, <laughs> come on, six grandchildren. <laughs> Four of me on. <laughs> but you, you, you have to know what you're good at and what you're not good at. And become better at it. <laughs> <laughs> Next point. <laughs> Be at peace with the things you love. Now, some people are embarrassed because they like certain things. You know, the accountant loves numbers. And then somebody says, you're an accountant. That's dull and boring. 
No, don't apologize for it. If you love it, love it with a passion. And use it for Jesus. I don't know how you do that, but use it for Jesus. <laughs> you know, some people love sports. Some people love bird watching. Some people love fashion and design and movies and whatever you love. Yeah. Well, God's given you those passions. The, the type of people that you love. God puts those desires and those passions inside you. Be yourself and express his life through them. Your abilities, your personality, your experiences. Just be your beautiful self as the season changes. Nobody's saying change into something else. We're just saying, no, just turn Jesus up. Yeah. Let him shine through who you are. Be yourself. Second thing I think we have to be in this season is we have to be organized. Be organized. Uh, some Christians are terrible. Can't even organize themselves to get here. I don't just mean you, Owen. <clears throat> I mean, we can't get ourselves to church on time sometimes, can we? We can't get ourselves to keep appointments. We can't. It's just, it does my head in sometimes. I think turning Jesus up is turning Jesus' values up. And he's consistent, he's committed, he's reliable. He's true to his word, and those values have to characterize us as his his people, haven't they? Uh, We have to be organized. I'm thinking about David, I realized... When, when he was in the sheep pen, his dad actually organized his life for him. Do you remember the time when um, uh, Samuel the prophet, he comes to Bethlehem to anoint the future king? <clears throat> Nobody knows that's what he's going to do, but he, God's told him, go and anoint one of the sons of Jesse. So all the sons are invited to the party, as it were, to meet the great prophet, and he's going to anoint one of them. But dad decides, we have to still organize family. And organizing family means that the youngest goes out with the sheep. See you, David. David must have been really ticked. Because if you read that chapter, 1 Samuel 16, it says that the Samuel, the prophet, invited Jesse and his sons to the party. All of them, including David. But David got the short straw. I can imagine him trudging up the hill. He's flipping sheep. And the sound of the party going on in the background as he gets further away. Well, it's stuff like that that actually tested his heart. And God saw that and thought, that's my boy. There he is, prepared in hands and heart. Great attitude. Nobody saw that but God. (laughs) And of course, he's the one that ends up being anointed. His His dad organized his life at that stage. It was his dad that was organizing him when he sent him to the front with the cheese sandwiches for his brothers. But there was a process at work. And gradually... He was empowered, he learned responsibility, and the organizational skills that he learned in the sheep pen helped him rule the country. I think we do ourselves a disservice as God's people when we're disorganized. And I would challenge you, is your money organized? You know, is your devotional life organized? Or is it hit and miss? I read the Bible when I feel like it. Mm, Yeah, I pray every now and again. No, get organized. Take control of it. If God is saying to us, come on, turn the heat up, turn, G, turn me up, we need to be organized, whatever that means for you. Have a pattern, have a system that keeps you close to Jesus, that keeps you in his word, that keeps you talking to the Holy Spirit, that keeps you in church, in and around the right people. Organize yourself. I think David, by the time he got to Goliath, was a self-starter. He was organized enough to know, I can't do it Saul's way, I have to do it my way. Now, sometimes people will say to you, well, have you had your quiet time today? You know, were you up at half past four like I was this morning, seeking the Lord on the mountain? <clears throat> and then you can feel bad because you're not doing it that spiritual way. Uh, there's, there's no one right or wrong way. You just to be organized for you because you have to be yourself. And God's saying, come on, turn Jesus up. Well, what does that mean for you? Maybe it means making a a strong decision. No, I am going to fast a day a week or a day a month. No, I I am going to deliberately read the word every day. No, even pastors and leaders struggle to read the Bible every day. And this is how I get around it. I listen to it. So if I've not had the opportunity because of life and all the rest of it (coughs) to read, I put it on in the car. Because with technology, you just plug your iPad or your iPhone in with version, and you don't have to read it, you can listen to it. 
I am, I'm getting so much from listening to the Bible at the moment rather than reading it. Good. And I've just got one of, the, one of the reading programs that's on your version. Just, just do what is right for you. Don't be under condemnation that somebody else is doing it a different way. But, but do organize yourself. Good. Take firm hold of your life. Take a hold of your, your career. Take hold of your leisure time who your friends are, what you do with your life. Because if you're going to dial Jesus up, it does affect everything, doesn't it? So, be yourself and be organized. Third thing is, be involved. Be involved. <clears throat> what I like about David's life is that he, he stays busy. He's involved in the life of the family. He's involved in the life of the palace eventually. Um, you never, there's never a period in his life where you think he's idle, he's drifting, except maybe when he should have gone to war. Some of you who know his whole story know he had hit a bad patch, and at the peak of his prowess when he was king and things were going well, he took the foot off the gas, slowed down. And the scripture says in 1 Samuel 11, 2 Samuel 11, that at the time when kings go off to war. David stayed behind in the palace. He should have been busy. He should have been involved. He should have been leading the troops. And then he was tempted by Bathsheba and ends up sleeping with her. And the rest is history. Disaster in his world. Now we've got to stay involved. You've got to stay busy enough and involved enough to keep connected to the change that God is doing Good. in a given church yeah. or organization. It's people who are not involved that miss it. Yeah. And things change, and they look around one day and go, oh, ooh, things have changed around here. Oh, I'm not sure I belong anymore. Yeah. But it's people who are involved that just morph with the change. They grow with the change. Because they were there. They were present. Yeah. They heard that message. Or they were so organized, they got the podcast and listened to it afterwards. And they, they connected with what God was saying and... They chatted about it in the small group and they actually managed to get a chat with the pastor about it. Only they feel part of the process. Good. You've got to be involved like David was. I think if you're not involved, you can quickly feel left behind or marginalized as things begin to change in church life. So be involved, whatever that means for you. Whether it's in serving, giving, whether it's time, whatever it means, be involved. You know, they made me voices when you do involve, like David's brothers. <laughs> if you read the story of Goliath, when he got there, they were kind of like, what are you doing here? They didn't even appreciate the sandwiches he brought. <laughs> it's like, oh, what are you doing here? Oh, it's the cocky little brother. What's, you know? And they poo-pooed him and put him down. And sometimes when you think, okay, God, I'm going to respond to your word. I'm going to get more involved. I'm going to commit a little bit deeper. I'm going to read my Bible more. Some will look at it and say, oh, we're becoming all spiritual, are we then? Yeah, and it kind of just puts you down a bit. It's a sarky comment. It just, and you can, you've got to be ready for that. You have to be ready to ignore that. You know, the wrong reactions of others should never influence you. It's their problem, not yours. When, you're, when your heart is a heart of integrity... And you're just desperately wanting to get more skill in your hands because you want to be part of turning Jesus up in the community with us. Take your cue from heaven. That's what David did. He ignored the voice of his brothers. <clears throat> he even had vo ignored the voice of Saul. All he was listening to was heaven. And he could hear God thinking, what is this uncircumcised Philistine saying? And David articulated what God's feelings were and became the vehicle of God's, an instrument of God's wrath in that situation. So get energized by what God sees, what God feels about situations and about the change. Get stuck in. Serve, give, help, devote yourself. And you'll navigate the change really well. You know, people that don't navigate change well are usually the ones who are not involved. So be yourself, be organized, be involved. Just quickly, a fourth thought is be bold. It goes without saying that he must have had some guts, must David. I mean, to run towards Goliath, however good he thought he was, 
I can't, it was human. I can't believe he didn't have a little voice at the back of his head going, you're going to miss, you're going to miss, you're going to miss. Because I know I would. <laughs> or another voice saying, he's got four brothers, you know. <laughs> They'll be after you. Well, I've got five stones just in case. You know, it's, all that would have been going on in his head because he was human. So he had to be courageous. You know, when, li- when life is routine, when you've slipped into a pattern and you feel God saying to you, up the ante, sometimes you have to be bold to break the routine, to make change. As every new season brings fresh challenges and um, fresh opportunities. Maybe there's a Goliath out there staring you in the face. And you know you need to take him down. And God's speaking to you about taking him down. It may be something that you think about too much. It may be a bad habit you've got. Maybe just be an aspect of ill discipline in your life. And you know God that every now and again, God gets on your case about it. You think, that is like flipping Goliath for me. I'm going to take him out. I can't turn Jesus up without taking that Goliath out. Yeah. Which, but it's going to take some courage. I may actually have to ask for help. I might have to go and see if I can get a bit of counsel or advice. I might need to broaden the circle of input to give me the wisdom I need to navigate it. <clears throat> that takes courage. You know, this morning at the end of the service when Owen was inviting people to come forward, I, I, I was listening and I could, in his language was, we don't do this and it, can, it takes courage to do this for some of you. But how awesome that some people did. Yeah. And they, they bit the bullet and said, right. And they, they sort of overcame their fear, overcame their doubt, and, and responded. Take some risks. Yeah. In a time of change, you've got to take some risks. If you just keep doing the same things, nothing will change. You know, they say it's the first sign of madness, don't they, that if you keep ex- doing the same thing but expecting a different result. No, that's just bonkers. It won't happen. You do the same things, you will get the same result. Yeah. But God's saying, come on, I want some different results, so we have to do some different things, which will mean we have to be courageous. So... Be yourself, be organized, be involved, but also be bold when you need to be bold. And my last thought is this. You have to be new. Be new. You know, David entered a new season because he tackled Goliath. The years in the sheep pen had paved the way. The the years of serving his dad had paved the way for it. He got prepared in hands and heart, like we've said, And we all have our equivalents, the family routine, the work routine, life, leisure, business. It's our sheep pen. And I mean, God says, turn up Jesus. Come on, change. We can get all excited. We say, right, well, I've got to be myself. I'm going to get organized, be involved, be bold. But actually, there's a sense in which you have to be new. You have to deliberately think This is a new season. I'm going to be a new me. I'm going to have a new attitude. For things to be fresh, for things to be bright and relevant and helpful, I have to be new. Well, I thought it was Jesus that renewed us. He does. But from the inside out, you need new eyes, new attitude, new mindset. You've got to almost like David who said, enough's enough. We're going to take this guy out. You've got to say, enough's enough of the old. I'm going to really dare to believe, God, this is a new season for me. Tomorrow's a new day. And you can actually, you can create newness through positive, spirit-filled thinking, by taking God at his word, by taking these bold steps and step into a A kind of a new world. It's an issue of perspective and an issue of of attitude. Isaiah the prophet wrote it like this in Isaiah 43. It's a famous scripture, verse 18. He says, forget the former things and do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? It's a very interesting scripture in the way it's balanced. Forget the former things. Now that makes you think like, ooh, yeah, I've got to forget the war. You know, forget my granddad and forget things that are really a long way back. No, maybe forget yesterday. Forget that conversation you had yesterday that got you down. Forget that boss that sacked you on Friday. 
Uh, forget that person who betrayed a confidence. Forget the former things. Anything that weighs you down or hinders you or keeps you in the sheep pen too long, forget it. Don't dwell on it. Because God says, I'm doing a new thing. And this is the way I'm describing it. I'm calling it, turn up Jesus. Let's just, let's just elevate Jesus. Let's shine brighter. Let's represent him better. It's an, it, now it springs up. And the question is, don't you perceive it? Yeah. Haven't you noticed? <laughs> well, I'd suggest to you, those that noticed, are those that were here, yeah. you know, the ones that were involved, <clears throat> the ones who um, were organized enough to, to be here and all that, the ones who are committed to being themselves, who are bold enough to now do something about it. And they will allow it just to shape their thinking and they'll think, it's a new day. Yeah. Next Sunday is going to be a new Sunday. Right. Not just because they've got smoke coming out of the box. <laughs> or not just because you know, they've changed the lights or something. Because no, I'm going to come with a new attitude. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to come with a new approach. I'm going to... God's turned up. You know, I, I'm bringing God with me. It's going to be a great day in the house. And if you can bring the newness with you, be new in the attitude of your mind, it says in the New Testament. Yeah. Be new in the attitude of your mind. I really do believe God has just given us a nice kick in the pants <clears throat> across the three congregations and said, at the start of this year, you committed to be a people of heart and soul. And you said, and you meditated on being servant-hearted, otherly-minded, united in purpose, and legacy-leaving. Well, if that's the kind of people you're going to be, you're going to have to turn me up. That's essentially what God is saying to us. And for us to respond to that means us individually saying, okay, Lord, right, I'm in. Yeah. I'm in. And I'm going to be all these things that I'm talking about tonight so that the net result is that when you meet in your life group, whether it's this week or next week, when youth get together, when you come back next Sunday, you actually all are, are entering a, a, a new church. It's like a new experience every time we meet because we're all keeping growing and changing and allowing God to take us forward. And what keeps it rolling, I think, is understanding that wherever you're at in your sheep pen right now, your family, your business, your normal life, if you will just keep your heart right and keep your skills developing, God sees that. You don't have to worry about people. God sees it. And if you will keep working on it, keep growing, keep loving him, keep prioritizing him, keep the kingdom first, as together we turn up Jesus, all sorts of people are going to pop up with new ministry ideas, with new initiatives. You're going to see different people on the platform. You'll see different people out on the streets reaching people. You'll find new people coming. And it's going to be, wow, church is awesome. What did we do? Well, all we did was we turned Jesus up and all committed to the process and stayed involved so that we leave a legacy, which is one of our values for my granddaughter. Yeah. So one day she might be part of this church. Fancy that. She might be. Because yeah. we are half Northern Irish, half Belfast, both there. Okay, that's me done. Thanks for downloading our podcast today. We hope it helps and encourages you. You are very welcome to join us any Sunday at 11am and 6pm at our church home at 11 Bruce Street, Belfast. Check out our website at www.lifechurchbelfast.com for more details.